1969, she has been lecturing, lecturing modern Japanese intellectual history as an associate professor at the California State University. She is currently the director of the Center for Asian Studies at the California State University and is the director of the Center for Women's Studies, CSU. Dr. Sievers first came to Japan as a pre-doctoral fellow in 1965 and did research on Japanese modern history at the Inter-University Center for Japanese Studies in Tokyo till 1966. Dr. Sievers came to Japan in September again last year as a Japan Foundation Fellow for the main purpose of studying Japanese women in Meiji and their thought. She is going to stay here until the middle of July of this year. The subject on which she is going to speak this afternoon is an American's view of Japanese women. She will be more than happy to answer any questions you may have after the lecture is over. Dr. Sievers. Thank you, Mr. Ibe. And I want to thank, of course, the Center for inviting me here today. And uh, since this is the first formal opportunity I've had to thank the Japan Foundation for making this here in Japan possible, I would, of course, like to thank them for a very generous grant, <coughs> which has made it possible for me to spend uh, this year in Japan doing what is, for me, extremely important research on women in the Meiji period. Um, before I begin, I should perhaps say that I'm used to being interrupted when I'm talking, so um, rather than to give uh, a rigidly formal lecture, if you have questions or comments while I'm speaking, please feel absolutely free to make them. Um, I understand there will be time for discussion once I'm finished speaking, so any disagreements we have we can certainly discuss at that, at that point, if not in the middle of uh, my discussion. The status of Japanese women as perceived by outsiders has been a very sensitive issue in Japan for quite some time, um, certainly at least since the Meiji period, and probably uh, for very good reasons. The status of women in Japan is conceived I think, um, by Japanese who are sensitive to outside criticism, is perceived as an issue involving human rights, which in part it is. But it also is perceived and has been perceived over the past century um, as an issue which involves Japan's advance in the modern world. Uh, it, it, it has implications in terms of Japan keeping up with the modern world. As an illustration of the fact that the Japanese um, are still very sensitive about this issue, um, I can point to a recent exchange in the newspapers between, a, um, between the president of the French Communist Party, Mr. Maché, um, who said for some reason or another in the process of uh, that French political campaign, made the comment that Japanese women were little more than slaves, <clears throat> which prompted an uncharacteristically undiplomatic remark from Mr. Ushiba, um, who replied something to the effect that um, the French were slaves, period, slaves to their vacations or something of that sort. I can also point, I think, as an indication uh, to, as, to this fact, as an indication of um, continuing Japanese sensitivity to outside views of the status of women in Japan. Um, the fact that the Japanese government, while it has done, I, I think, very little, to appoint women to important domestic political positions, it has nonetheless appointed a number of women to significantly visible international positions in the United Nations most recently, but also uh, to ambassadorial posts. <clears throat> I think the Japanese may have a legitimate complaint in the sense that many people from the Meiji period on who have uh, looked at the status of Japanese women from the outside um, or have criticized Japanese, uh, the Japanese society on the issue of the woman question, 
um, are people who have not really had much more than a superficial understanding of what is involved. Without question, the people best equipped to discuss and analyze the question of women in Japan are Japanese women themselves. And um, I have been very encouraged by the number of Japanese women who are beginning to do just that. Over the past 10 years, <coughs> Japanese women have done an enormous amount of research on their own past, and they have made accessible historical materials which had formerly been lost in the shuffle of history. And it is that work primarily that I've been using um, to study Meiji women. What I have to say about Japanese women today comes partly from my reading of those sources, partly from my reading of the discussion that's been going on among Japanese women about their own status and their own situation. But it also comes, and I think I, in fairness, must point this out to you, it also comes from the fact, uh, my, my view of Japanese women clearly also comes from the fact that I'm an American who happens to be an historian, but more than that, I am an American feminist. <coughs> What I would like to do today is to bring you a very general and perhaps oversimplified view of contemporary Japanese women seen from this perspective, but also seen from the historical perspective of the Meiji period, and to offer you some perhaps uh, gratuitous suggestions relative to the implications of change uh, for women in Japan. The very broad areas I would like to discuss are politics, the changing nature and perception of uh, roles of women in Japan, women in the economy, and finally, if time permits, um, I would like to engage in some brief discussion about women in education in Japan. Most of you know, I think, that um, one of the burning political issues in early Meiji was the issue of political equality. And that the popular rights movement in Japan was founded in part on natural rights philosophy. What many people, I suppose, do not know <clears throat> is that there were a number of women who took part in the popular rights movement and who took natural rights very seriously um, and assumed that na arguments about natural rights in the popular rights, in the popular rights movement itself extended to women as well. Um, politics was a natural arena where this sort of um, discussion about equality on the part of women and for women developed. Kusunosu Kita was one of the first women to demand the right to vote in Japan. She was a woman from what was then still Tosa. And she thought it was only fair that she'd be, she'd be allowed to vote in local elections since as a householder who had lost her husband, she paid taxes to that community and thought she should vote. Kusunosu Kita uh, did not go on after this initial protest to make a very important contribution to the popular rights movement in Japan, but a number of other women did, among them Kishida Toshiko, who was perhaps, if the records are accurate, the most effective orator in the popular rights movement. The women were not really permitted to speak for very long um, publicly in Japan on political issues at the most probably about three years uh, during the 1880s. But Kishida Toshika was certainly one of the women <coughs> who pushed for equal rights for women in, on, uh, in most areas of life and, in particularly, uh, and particularly in the area of politics. More of you may be familiar with the name Fukuda Hideko, who was also a very important uh, figure in the early popular rights movement and a woman who demanded equal rights for women. What happened to all of these early demands on the part of women in the Meiji period for the vote and for political equality was that the government <coughs> in the last decade of the 19th century Japan, of 19th century Japan, reinforced its earlier attitudes uh, toward women in politics by finally passing in 1900 a so-called peace preservation law, <clears throat> Article 5 of which denied women not simply the right to vote or to join political parties, but denied all women in Japan the right to attend political meetings, the right to speak publicly on any political issues, 
or to political or to politically participate in the society in any way at all. Women struggled to have Article 5 removed from the peace preservation law all the way down to the 1920s, and they were finally able in about 1922 to um, get some of the restrictions in Article 5 removed, but some of them still remain. And um, most of you know that um, suffrage itself, of course, was not won by Japanese women until after the war. Though so I think if one looks carefully at the struggle carried on by Japanese women to get the vote and the political struggle which was carried on by Japanese women before the war, in behalf of which many went to jail, um, I think that, it, that one has to agree that it's very unfair to call uh, the vote which was given to women in Japan, given in quotes, I should say, um, to call that a gift of the occupation. Japanese women before the war certainly earned the right to vote. One of the most interesting things about the Meiji period in terms of the political experience of women is the ease with which the government was able to manipulate the political roles of women and the ease with which the government defined what was proper politically for women in terms of society as a whole. The best example I can uh, give you of this is the government's encouragement and sponsorship of the Japanese Patriotic Women's Society, which certainly was a political organization if there ever was one. Um, the sponsorship of that organization and the encouragement of it because it suited the government's notion of what sort of politics women should engage in. At the same time, um, it was encouraging women to join this patriotic society, supporting Japanese soldiers in the field, and supporting Japanese foreign policy. It was, um, on the other hand, denying women the right to vote and the right to participate in any sort of, dis any sort of discussion of domestic political issues. Well, certainly if you compare that situation in the pre-war period with what has happened since the war, it has to be said that it really is no longer possible for the government in this society, or hopefully in any society, to manipulate the political roles of women in the same way and to define for women what their political roles will be. One of the most interesting things about the political activities of Japanese women in the post-war period is, I think, the emphasis, the emphasis that Japanese women have placed on the issues of peace and democracy. That, I think, is an emphasis which might be emulated by women's movements other places in the world. It sometimes, uh, sometimes seems a little ironic to me that American women in the women's movement spend so little time talking about peace and so little time talking about the importance of disarmament these are constant themes, I think, among Japanese women. But it's ironic, nonetheless, that American women should spend so little time discussing these issues when they live in a country, I live in a country, which represents at least half of the world's problem in this respect. And I suppose that, at the very least, I can say that American women have something to learn from Japanese women in this regard. We ought to think more about whether or not there is going to be a world around in the future um, to enjoy once we have achieved some of the goals of the women's movement uh, that we're now working on. A lot of people, I think, if, as they look at the political um, situation, Japanese women in the post-war period, are very discouraged because there are so few Japanese women um, sitting in the lower house and so few sitting in the upper house. There's something like 15 women who have been elected to the upper house and seven to the lower house, um, at least in the most recent elections. Um, I suppose if one uses that as the yardstick by which to measure the political success of women in the post-war period in Japan, that is a, a rather discouraging statement. <coughs> but if one looks further at the political activities of women, particularly in the last five to eight years, 
I think uh, what one finds is encouraging is not exciting. It seems to me that more and more Japanese women are involving themselves in what is very basic political activity in any society, involving themselves in social movements, which include some of the things we've already talked about, include the emphasis on peace and nuclear disarmament. But um, beyond that, they're involving themselves in issues involving consumer rights, uh, protection of the environment, issues which involve the ed education of their children, a number of basic human issues which um, American women would recognize as something they've been involved in recently uh, themselves as well. What I think this may mean in the future in terms of um, the status of women in Japan and the options that women may have is that it's quite possible that a new women's politics may grow out of this just as it did in the United States. I'm not saying that it will demonstrate itself um, socially in the same ways or that the style that Japanese women adopt will be an American style or anything of the sort. It may very well be di very different, but what happens to women who involve themselves in these kinds of social movements, at least what happened in the United States, was that women gained enormous political expertise in these kinds of movements. They lost their um, political innocence, as it were, <coughs> and began to understand what it takes to, um, to make uh, a hope for a goal a reality in political terms. It requires power, the ability to exercise power. And in the process of, of uh, that experience, a number of American women got into politics themselves. And out of this grassroots movement, I think it's really not uh, inaccurate to say that American women, along with minorities in America, began to change the face of American politics. It hasn't been changed sufficiently yet, of course, but it has been changed a great deal. And that is also a possibility in Japan. So I think that it's much, much too narrow to view the success of politics um, as it pertains to Japanese women simply by measuring the number of women elected to highly visible positions in society. That's an important issue, I think. But a far more important issue is whether or not larger and larger numbers of women consider political roles appropriate to them. And this is what I think is happening in contemporary Japan, and for very good reason. Um, so as Japanese women uh, begin to exercise their options to use time that they have in social movements, I think you will find them becoming politically much more aware and politically much more active. This in turn will very likely produce something like a women's politics in the future. Um, and as a result of that, hopefully, we'll begin to see more women in visible positions of um, power in the society at large. So the political role may be another role that the Japanese woman is adding to a long list of roles she's already playing. What about social roles in general in Japan? What about changing attitudes uh, that women have about their roles in Japanese society? Everywhere in the world, um, in every woman's experience, marriage and the family are these social institutions um, where women feel the greatest pressure to conform, for the most part. In the early Meiji period, most of you are aware there are a number of men, uh, among them, of course, the members, some of the members of the Meiruk A number of men who wanted to see a different definition of roles for women within the family. That's a very important distinction. Not just roles for women in the society, but roles for women within the family itself. The term ryosai kembo, which everyone today uses uh, so frequently, and has used over the past century so frequently, Ryosai Kembo, uh, good wife, wise mother, uh, is a term that was first used by a member of the Meiruk a man by the name of Nakamura, to describe a new relationship within the family which would be based on equality and the partnership of a husband and wife living in a monogamous relationship. That in itself was a great change over what had been at least uh, the samurai pattern family 
um, in the Togawa period. Riosai Kembo, the term Riosai Kembo was expanded and enlarged by one of the best known women educators of the Meiji period, a woman by the name of Hatoyama Haruko, um, who made the idea of that kind of partnership between a man and a wife in marriage, made it a goal of her own life and a goal of the educational institutions of which she was a part. Women in Meiji generally welcome this redefinition of their social roles within the family, but many Japanese women went far beyond that to suggest that their roles in the society at large should be redefined and that their roles in the society in general should be expanded. Um, it's very clear that in the middle of the Meiji period, at least, there were a very large number of women who felt very strongly that they had the right to take place, to take an active role, to take an active part in the whole process of modernization in Japan. And that, that clearly would involve, to some extent, their roles as wives and mothers, but it would also involve their roles as politicians doing all kinds of other things in society, which is important to its growth. And these women, among them, uh, a couple of women I've already mentioned, Kishida and Kuda, these women really wanted to see, uh, basically, an expanded number of options for women in the society at large. And they clearly thought, for a time anyway, that this was a real possibility in a modern, uh, modernizing Japan. Kishida first wrote in 1884 in an article which is supposed to be the first article in print, at least, um, in, the, in, in any uh, newspaper, which advocated openly equality between men and women. In this article, Kishida talks about um, equality, but it's important to remember that when Kishida talked about equality, she really saw that. She saw, saw male and female equality as an absolute requisite to progress of civilization everywhere. She saw it in very um, universal terms, in very, um, I suppose we might say, humane terms. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the things that she wrote in that period. In our country there were in ancient times a number of evil teachings and customs, things which would make the people of a free, independent, civilized country terribly ashamed. Of these, the worst custom was Danson Johi, respecting men while despising women. We are today attempting to build a humane society. This is the reason I speak of equality and equal rights. However, in this country, men are, as before, respected as masters and husbands. Women continue to be held in contempt as servants. There can be no equality in such an environment. <clears throat> Fukuda Hideko, who, when she was 16, um, was living in a, she was living in a very impoverished family situation. She was one of several children, and her father had been a low-ranking samurai at the time of the Restoration, who had become a policeman to try to make enough money to support his family. Fukuda's mother worked as a school teacher, and basically the family was in very uh, difficult economic circumstances throughout most of um, its life. In that situation, Fukuda's parents received a proposal of marriage from a rather well-to-do family in a nearby village, which would clearly have solved many of Fukuda's uh, parents' economic uh, problems. Fukuda had never met the man in question, and at the time actually was interested in someone else. but. Her parents, of course, were very eager to see her make this marriage um, to help them out economically if for no other reason. This Fukuda refused to do. Um, but at the same time, she was very much aware of the point that her parents were making, and she discussed the issue with them at length. The compromise the family finally reached over this issue of marriage was that if Fukuda would not agree to marry, the son of this well-to-do family, that she would then have to turn over most of her income to the family to help support it economically. And Fukuda writes in her um, 
autobiography that she was very much aware after this experience in her life of how many unhappy women there were in Japan, or perhaps even in the world at large, who marry a man without love because they are unable to be economically independent. One of the major themes of Fukuda's life and um, one of the major themes of all the schools that uh, she started and uh, taught in was that issue of economic independence for women and the importance of teaching women um, how to make a living on their own. <coughs> These are just two examples of uh, Meiji women who basically wanted to see different kinds of, of options and different kinds of roles for women in Japanese society in general. But what happened to all of this discussion in the last decade of the 19th century? And most of you know, I think, that in education and so social life in general, the Meiji government made of the term Ryosai Kenbo a sort of uh, Confucian, uh, a Confucian term, which was used um, in education and elsewhere for women, not, um, not to describe an equal relationship between men and women in marriage, but to describe a relationship which was much, much closer to the Tabgawa pattern, in which the wife was expected to be not a partner, but a loyal and submissive uh, part of the family relationship, which was not based on equality. At the same time, in the civil codes, incidentally, I should say that the term Rio Sai Kembo itself, the Meiji government really did such a good job of selling this as a Confucian term that when women in the post-war period began to do research dealing with women, they all, of that, um, even the best of them, Takamura Itsue among them, they all assumed that it was a term which came out of a Tokugawa Confucian text for women. I mean, what else could it be? And they were all very shocked to discover that it was a term which was invented in Meiji by a member of the Meiruk Shah, and it was intended as a sort of reforming vehicle for women, not as something uh, repressive and certainly not as something Confucian and not something backward-looking. In any case, in the civil codes, which were finally enacted in 1898, the government, in effect, made all of Japan into a single samurai family. The work of, the very important work of Takamura Itsue shows that while in the Togawa period, family custom as it operated among Farming families, of course, and among merchant families, gave women, in many cases, a great many options and all kinds of latitude, partly in terms of the disposing of property. Um, it was customary in many merchant families, for example, to, to divide property in the family among both men and women, male and female children. There were no uh, real patterns in um, farming families, but certainly, the samurai family at the top of society was the most repressive for women, for women in every sense. It was here that women had the least rights. And in 1898, when the civil codes were enacted, that was the pattern that was used. It was a very backward-looking um, sort of move for the government to take and very, very significant in terms of the future of women. What it did for Japanese women in this period was to reduce them to the level of mental, of, uh, of mental incompetence under the law. Japanese women were put legally in the same category with people who were mentally incapable of bringing any kind of, uh, any kind of legal issue before the court. So under the civil codes of 1898, Japanese women became legal incompetence. They were not able to initiate legal action of any kind in the courts. This, uh, at about the same time, in 1900, that, as I just mentioned, Japanese women became political incompetence under the Peace Preservation Law, uh, Article 5 of the Pre Peace Preservation Law of 1900. If one looks at the post-war situation compared with this uh, pre-war picture, which is a very brief one, to be sure, um, it is obvious that in the area of social, the area of social change is the hardest to measure in terms of what is going on with women in Japan today. And while it's quite true that Japan's liberal constitution, so liberal that probably no country in the world could really live with it uh, very effectively, the gift of 
the American occupation. Um, in spite of the fact that the Constitution uh, guarantees equality in all areas of Japanese life, This is obviously an ideal rather than a reality. Uh, many issues which pertain directly to women have not yet effectively been tested in the courts. And I think one has to say that in terms of social change, um, the most dramatic social change in Japan has come partly as a result of changes in the family, the structure of families uh, in Japan. The fact that in the post-war period in contemporary Japan, uh, the nuclear family has effectively replaced the extended family pattern that most Japanese now consider themselves middle class in terms of their economic orientation. Within this framework, the attitudes of Japanese women about their own roles are naturally changing. Um, 